Welcome to Something to Talk About from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center, sponsored by Fieldstone Memory Care, Bainbridge Island. Fieldstone offers innovative and compassionate care, now accepting residents. Call for a tour at 360-271-2530 to experience Fieldstone's beautifully appointed apartments on Rolling Bay. And they are, those are beautiful grounds there. I've been there many times. So anyhow, but it's my pleasure to once again, invite our dear friend Ann Lovejoy to talk to us about gardening. Good morning, Thank Ann. Thank you, Karen. Good morning. And good morning, everybody. I hope you all have lots of questions. I would like to um, start off by saying that one of the things to think about if you're out gardening is that it hasn't rained for a few days, which seems weird. But one of the things that happens when it hasn't rained for a few days is that the beautiful layers of spring pollen start accumulating on plants and all over the place. And if the little wind picks it up, it blows all over the place. So some people think that they're getting sick and what they're having is a pollen reaction. It's another big pollen event year. Um, very typically after a, a year with some big weather events, the plants will respond by creating extra pollen. So if you just cast your mind back a few months, you will recognize, a few weeks, <laughs> you will recognize that we've had quite a few between the heat dome in last June and the big chill in December and January. I think we can all agree that um, the plants have something to talk about too. And what they're saying is, help, we need to propagate and sending out pollen left and right. Now, pollen is male and it's quite heavy and it also um, tends to drift. So that's one of the things to think about. And the, to me, one of the silver linings of this pandemic is that we're getting used to wearing masks. And the really good news is that the N95 type of mask is actually pretty good protection against inhaling a lot of pollen. Um, just so you know. <laughs> Another thing I wanted to talk about a little is a lot of people have been asking me about what do you do with your amaryllis after they finish blooming? Um, Mine got stunned by that cold. We live in a mobile home and it maybe we couldn't really keep it quite as warm as it might have been. So they're just starting to put out some blooms now. But if you think of an amaryllis as a house plant, not as an expensive toss away, um, and you treat it like a house plant and feed it periodically, you will find that they actually will live for years and will rebloom really nicely. And eventually they start producing these little offsets called pups and you can plant them out. They like a shallow bowl, wide shallow bowl. Um, but if you have, if you can get five new leaves after the bloom by feeding it properly, you will get another bloom spike. So I'm gonna show you one that I did from last year. Um, and uh, can you see that there's a nice fat bud there yes. as well as six, a fan of six leaves. So what you wanna do is keep, um, I wipe down the foliage periodically because they're still photosynthesizing, even if they're just on a windowsill. Um, and that dust on the foliage can make it much harder for them to do that. Um, but if you just wipe it down with water, you don't ever want to put that weird wax stuff on that you can buy wax for house plants. I'm like, um, I don't think that's nature's way. So just a little wet cloth, keep them uh, cleaned off. And I feed them. I usually make a little elixir. Some of you have heard me talk about this before, but I do a mixture of liquid sea, um, liquid kelp and uh, a sea, sort of a fish, fish fertilizer, liquid fish fertilizer. And um, sometimes I'll put a few other little things in there, but mostly it's the kelp and the fish fertilizer together. Um, that. Oh, humic acid is the other thing I often put in, liquid humic acid. And you can buy that, like ACE has it, you know, Rite Aid has it in there. <laughs> you know, it's pretty common, it's not expensive. But humic acid is the principal, it's the one of the principal elements in compost that um, neutralizes soil and helps roots take up nutrients better and improve soil quality. It's not a fertilizer as such, it's not that kind of nutrient, but it is a soil nutrient. Um, and it's really just a great thing to use on houseplants, which are usually sitting in the same soil for quite a long time. Like not that many people um, repot their houseplants all that often. So I think it's, uh, it's worth remembering that they could use a refreshment. All right. 
Yeah, I agree with you uh, about uh, the pollen. Uh, I have really nasty cedar pollen uh, allergies. And I, that's, I felt started feeling sick. And I was getting stuff that made me feel like, oh, did I catch something? And so I went and had a test done at the clinic. And luckily, it wasn't the crud. But uh, uh, you know what, that evil, evil COVID. But uh, so it came back clean. But but I'll tell you, it, boy, those pollen, that the pollen really can make you feel sick, like you're catching something. Yeah, because your system recognizes it as an invalid, as an alien invader. Um, it's not good for your lungs. And so, yes, yeah, a lot, of, and especially <laughs> as we mature, mm -hmm. uh, we our reactions are stronger. Mm. I actually was kind of whining to my doctor at one point about having plant allergies. And she's like, well, what do you expect? If you stick your nose in plants and you crawl around in plants and you're always breathing, it's like, okay, fine. Um, so the more we are exposing ourselves to plant pollen, the more likely it is that we might have issues. And in fact, two of my ex-sisters-in-law, of which I have, by the way, 12, um, two of them have developed strong allergies to amaryllis so you can get oh. allergies to indoor plants too oh that's of. not fair i'm sorry yeah. that Especially is not when your fair. apartment is kind of small you're like i'm trying to have a little nature experience here <laughs> oh, very sad so yeah i know but cedars i mean i who is not surrounded by cedars in this area they're everywhere they are and yeah, one of the things I used to do in self-defense was paint all my patio furniture this color, that sort of sagey green color of, of cedar, aged cedar pollen, because it made it, it's a good color to paint your house too, because it makes it less obvious that your house is crusted with um, pollen, especially mm -hmm. if it's wood. Uh, <laughs> and it's a beautiful color, you know. It really is. Yeah. The color of nature. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, if you... Um, if you've hooked your hoses back up, which most people probably have not, you can also kind of rinse off an area of the garden that you're planning to work in. There's still plenty to do out there. And I'm actually doing that. One of the things you want to always think about after a real rainy um, session is that the, the, that open soil is very, very compressible. I've talked about this before, but you got to remember every footprint, like if you just put one foot in the garden and stand on it, you're putting your entire weight on an area about so big, and it's definitely gonna compress that soil. So this is still a good time to be working from outside the beds for the most part, um, doing what you can without walking around in it. And if you have to walk around, use a piece of plywood or something like that to spread the weight over a larger surface area and walk on that or kneel on that rather than right into the soil itself. Oh, that is an excellent suggestion. I have never thought about that. Well, if you were soil, you would. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I can I ask a question? Sure, Megan. So um, a couple of months ago, we had a storm, and one of our western red cedars actually broke in half. Wow! And I think that's because of those really scorching days in July and August in the hundreds. Um, and it's really fortunate that it was away from the house, but if it had fallen on our roof, it definitely would have gone through. It was very heavy. Um, what do you recommend for that? You mean now that it's happened or? Well, yeah, we have a grove of trees, not too far, about 10 feet away from the house. Um, what should I do? Well, you know, I call a good certified arborist, and that's just not a guy with a truck and a chainsaw, but Katie Bigelow, is an excellent arborist um, and she is a consulting arborist and can write up reports. She doesn't necessarily do the actual work, but she can come in and recommend what needs to happen, like maybe thinning or, um, you know, she'll know, like she can look at trees. She's done that for our community where we have a lot of big evergreens and a lot of very small fragile houses um, mm -hmm. and we have to really watch that. But a, a certified arborist will not tell you to top a tree but can help you fix one, you know, as best as possible for one that has been, or tell you it can't be saved and it needs to be cut down. Um, one thing the tribe has asked us, the Suquamish tribe, is that if we're going to take down cedars, they ask if it's possible to do it in um, May and April and May when the native dogwood is blooming, because they would like to be able to come and harvest the uh, some of the branches and the the um, the bark. The bark. 
I just should tell everybody, I have had just recovering from COVID. And so when they talk about COVID brain, that's not a joke, actually. It's a thing. Okay. So if I look stunned and gaze off into the distance, it's a natural effect. Oh. Anyway, the tribe would love to hear from you. You can call Tina Jackson at the Suquamish tribe and invite them to come and harvest before you take down the bottom of the tree, if that's what's called for. Once it's broken off and lying around for a few months, I don't think it works the same way. They're not as as able to recover as much of the material from that. But um, but I thought it was interesting that the tribe is very, very uh, interested in gathering still whatever is usable. And when they take down cedars, they use pretty much every single thing mm -hmm. for something. So it's a no waste uh, way to deal with a, a problem like that. Um, but again, a certified arborist is somebody who actually is educated and has a, a whole toolkit of good solutions for tree problems that do not involve topping or whacking or mutilating them to, you know oh. pruning is not a size control technique that's news to a lot of people but it's something to really think about um, whenever you engage in size control issues with plants you're gonna i mean well the loser is whoever dies first right oh. but somebody's gonna so it's like you know, you and your chainsaw and your hedge, it's a perpetual battle to maintain size because plants don't listen. You know, if you cut them back, they'll just come back with a roar, right? That's their job. That's their mandate. Um, so if you're looking to control the size of something, you either want to move it, cause it to be moved by others, or take it out altogether if it's really inappropriate. It's a good time to maybe remind people too that if you're planting a tree of any kind, I don't care what the tag says, how small or big it's going to be, do not plant it so that it will touch your home at maturity or God forbid before that. Because trees are definitely um, little ladders and runways for tree rats, for squirrels, for all kinds of, I mean, even spiders, bugs, all kinds of stuff. And they're also collectors of mold and mildew and pollen, as we've discussed earlier. So you really don't want any plants touching the house. I like to, um, when I did garden design a lot, I would always think about the golden bowl, like your house is sitting in a golden bowl of sunshine and there are green walls around the outside that build up from small to large. But you really don't want lard right in the middle of your house, right? Sometimes we'd be taking out these huge old rhododendrons that had completely blocked not just the first story windows, but sometimes the second story windows. And when you move them, they have this one flat face. So we turn that one around and put that at the back against the woodlands and let the beautiful front five be now the new front. <laughs> and then they could have a new home and still be beautiful. Uh, but <laughs> you need light and air and good air exchange in your home. And plants that interfere with that are in the wrong place. And you're right about the, at the drought too, Megan, while I'm ranting here. Um, last year and for the last several years, we've had long, hot droughts. It's, it's very, very hard on native plants, which are, you know, for a few thousand years have been pretty used to wet summers, or at least very, very wet winters and, and summers that are not drying them out. Um, depending on the La Nina, El Nino, some of the summers may have been dry, but they usually weren't hot. And so the soil didn't didn't burn out the way it did in, when we get it bumped up into the hundreds, as we saw last year. Um, so some people have actually watered their native trees. Um, not sure that's enough to really be helpful, or you might have to really do it when you think about how many gallons of water a big fir can take up. But it's something to think about that um, we used to say never water native plants because it can be really harmful to them. Like madronas are very susceptible to a lot of diseases and if they get summer irrigation they can be more susceptible but in long-term drought hot drought situations that may not be the case anymore so we have to rethink and relearn the way that we manage our native plants as well as our garden plants okay all righty then <laughs> i have a question about my um uh evergreen blueberry have the through the three different blueberries and one it uh, during the snow and everything it lost its evergreen a lot of the leaves fell off and uh, uh i'm very concerned about the other two are budding out now yeah it will too it, it's was it sunshine blue or some one of those it, a lot of the evergreen blueberries are semi-evergreen and 
under duress, they will drop their leaves and they may be a little slower to put new ones on, but I wouldn't give up on it and I wouldn't prune it either. Okay, like, so don't prune it. Mm -mm. After the cold, you know, that was a pretty intense cold snap for, for the Pacific Northwest. And sometimes it can be pretty hard to tell if your plant is dead or not. And rather than um, dig around or whack away at it, it's really a good policy. If you can stand to just leave it alone, it's really the best choice. Um, it will tell you soon enough, like a lot of times a plant like a rosemary might look great for a few weeks and then it will start to brown off. Some of the rosemaries are actually quite tender. Others are rock hardy like ARP, which is one of the oldest, really tough ones. It doesn't care what happens. But some of the lovely, um, more floriferous rosemaries are pretty tender and almost all the prostrate ones or the hanging ones are quite tender. And you might indeed lose those pretty much completely or at least all the way back to the, the foundation. Um, it's something to think about that, you know, you can't always tell if something's gone or not, but we don't want to prune now, especially because we don't know if there isn't another cold blast coming up. Um, if you look at some of the NOAA predictions, they give it a 50-50 chance. That's so helpful, mm. right? It's mm. like, just throw dice. You just know as quickly. Um, so we don't know. And rather than take away whatever protection that top growth may be still offering, just leave it alone until a few months further down. Um, one thing to think about too is that the snow was a real blessing because snow is a great insulator. And so once the snow has built up on the ground, it's gonna hold steady at, you know, might be 32, but it's not gonna be 20 or 17, um, which means less root damage probably for a lot of plants that uh, could maybe take freezing, but not below freezing and they won't be wind burned in the same way either. Um, okay. Yeah, it's a so thing. Just, um, just be patient. And, yeah, and whatever you do, do not feed a damaged plant. Okay. Like a lot of people think, oh great, I, my lawn looks funky after that wet winter and I better feed it up. Don't feed anything until you see strong new growth. Mm -hmm. And if you don't see strong new growth, don't feed it at all and wait. And then like, sometimes I don't really prune the winter damage off until like April or May okay. because by then you're pretty sure that it's going to be you can tell what's still alive um, and and with a lot of perennials you'll see the crown might look all mushy and horrible I do usually take the mush away you might put a little clean compost around it um, so that it gets air and can breathe and drainage but it isn't sitting in a pile of mush but the the root may produce a good strong sprout still. Okay. Even if the top has kind of melted. Right. Rita, well, it looks like you had a question. Did yeah. you? I did. I had um, one is on your, on your soil nutrient to a quart of water. Is it like one tablespoon of each of those things? I just, or um, it's just. <laughs> you know, because the, the strength of them all varies with the brand. Look at the right. brand, look at the bottle, and it will usually tell you X amount oh. per gallon. Oh, know. okay. So I can just put, you know, all three together in yeah. whatever. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. That's that's good. And then I was going to say, so my, the hydrangeas, I need to leave alone. Yeah. Just for, well, they're pretty tough. But before right. we leave the, the fertilizer thing, let me just say, shake it up really good before you use it. Keep it out right. of direct light. And if you put it in something that wants to have food in it, you want to label it really well. I once was using an old um, maple syrup jug because it had a great pouring thing. And, and my son saw it sitting on the counter and poured it all over his pancakes. <laughs> and it wasn't there. So always label anything that it's it say plant food, do not drink or whatever. Make sure that you remind everybody and yourself if it's in an apple juice thing or something, right? <laughs> Okay. But yeah, and as then, far as the hydrangeas go, they're really quite tough. And if you look at right. them, you'll see they already have nice fat buds. Um, I usually cut them back to the biggest, you know, big set of buds, cut at an angle so that you have bevel kind right. of like this, so the rain can run off and not collect and pool. Um, and those, you can, if they're, you know, if you're starting to get annoyed, they're not going to get. Well, frost. I'm not annoyed, but you know, my son-in-law likes stuff tight. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, so, if you live with a tidy person, that um, it might be time. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Sure. Oh, and we had another question from Elizabeth Ozemek. She uh, she asked our question on Facebook. Um, it's shade gardens. She goes, "Help! I need help with my shade garden. Any words of wisdom?" 
I That's guess like broad, I know. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> okay, in 20 minutes or less. Um, <laughs> not sure what, but I would say this, that the thing I see most often with people's shade gardens is that they over groom and by tidying up all the time and sweeping and, you know, blowing and raking away the leaves and all that kind of stuff, they're actually robbing the soil and the plants of nutrients and making it, uh, make, and they get starving and they stop thriving. So mm -hmm. one of the things that's important there is to leave the leaves, as I said many, many times. If you're cleaning up things like ferns, you can do the chop and drop, chop them in little pieces, leave them yeah. right around the plant. All the leaves are packed with nutrients specifically designed to support the plant they come off of. Plants are full of information, they're full of nutrients. And again, if you have a tidy partner or friend, uh, you can put a little blanket of compost over the whole thing. Right, all yeah. that good. You can yeah. shred fallen leaves and put shredded leaves all over the whole thing, which will they'll break down a whole lot faster because shredding gives you so many more opportunities for bacteria to get to work on the little bits. Right, um, it can be hard to take on a big leaf maple <laughs> leaf when it's intact, but once you shred it, boom, it's right. gone, um, and that's great because that kind of adds to that beautiful. Um, the forest duff is made up of many, many years worth of shedded. Uh, not just foliage, but, you know, lichens and insects and all kinds of stuff is there, right? Bat poop, or, you know, everything. So all that rich mixture is like in site, it's created compost on site, right? And that is the best possible natural fertilizer. But again, if you're a tidy person and you just can't stand it, you can put a blanket of mature compost on top. Um, if you're going to dump bark, like shredded bark is not nutritious no. and it actually sheds water and can rob your plants, but right. shredded tree, the whole tree, arborist chips, medium to fine shred, those can work really, really well if that is um, readily available, which it should be because I think the tribe on 305, you know, Port Madison Enterprises carries it. I think Tills does. Um, there's quite a few places to get fine or medium grind wood chips. And that even mixed with compost, that's a great, great top dressing um, because it will allow water to get through um, and it covers up whatever you find unsightly um, and it will eventually become nutritious too. Uh, something for the tidy people. Yeah, <laughs> if she's concerned about the plant choices, I would say that, you know, one of the things we're learning is that as climate is changing, some of the native plants are stressed out too. And so making a combination of native Pacific Northwestern plants from a little further south can add uh, a little more longevity to our gardens. Um, you know, it's really hard to say what is gonna do well and you can't just take something from, you know, Eastern Oregon and plunk it into your woodland garden in, in Western Washington. but. But careful judicious selection is going to be really helpful. Um, and trial and error is always part of it. I think one of the things that's hard for people is the error part. Like you feel like if you've killed a plant, you've done something terrible. But usually, you know, it, often it isn't your fault. Like it may not have been in great condition in the first place. The weather, this crazy weather may have taken it out. Um, even salal has been developing all kinds of weather stress and you'll see big dead patches of salal all over the island um, and that's from drought and that makes them susceptible to other things that are around. So you know there's a lot going on out there and the best way to keep your garden looking great is to keep trying stuff, put in some new things and give them a chance. Um, I do feel like you know we don't know what kind of year this is going to be so you know, even though it's still January, I'd say if you're putting in a new plant and the ground is not really very wet, which it could possibly not be, um, water it in if you feel like you need to. You know, don't feel like because it's winter, you don't have to do that. Sometimes you really do. Um, and sometimes we've had a lot of rain in a fairly short time. It didn't absorb necessarily all that deeply. So look and use your senses, take your gloves off, feel the soil and and make a good judgment call, not just a reflexive one. Yeah. I heard we're supposed to have like a stretch of uh, sunny weather for about a week now. But I always remember, it seems like some of our biggest snow events were in February. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. we can all probably think back, what, three years? 
Mm -hmm. or so to a very big snow event in February. And that was one that sort of snuck up. It, you know, it hadn't been predicted to be quite as, as impressive as it really was. So that's a good thing to think about. Thank you, Karen, because if we do get another snow event, um, it's really wise to go out and shake it off the trees and shrubs if you can reach it. Not necessarily there'll be cedars, that's not so important, but definitely things like Japanese maples, some of the shapely shrubs. And you can, one thing I like to use is this long bamboo pole because they're lightweight. You don't risk whacking something really hard with a big stick, um, but you just wanna knock the snow off before it accumulates and especially before it freezes because once it freezes on there, it gets really heavy. And that's when we get a lot of breakage. Um, you get a little bit of melting in the day and then at night it will freeze and that makes a big heavy wad that will snap off the branches um, and not in a good way. <laughs> mm, no. So anybody else have a, let's see, looks like it's from Colleen. What does she have to say? Uh, oh, would you, uh, would you talk about hellebores? Yes. Oh, I absolutely. love hellebores. Who yeah. doesn't love those, so, right? <laughs> a lot of hellebores are starting to poke their little noses up. Um, some of the ones that would have been blooming earlier got a little daunted by the freezing weather and the layer of snow and ice, um, but they're coming up now. So one thing to really look at is remove all the foliage that has gone to the side or is starting to go earthward. Anything that has any spots on it at all, don't put it in your compost, put that in the green waste where it will get in professional compost that really goes to high temperatures. Um, botrytis is a real common issue and various foliage spot dis disorders uh, on, on hellebores, especially some of the, of course, fancier, more expensive ones, because <laughs> they're not always bred for um, strength and health, but they're bred for knockout flowers. Um, and sometimes those things are not super compatible. So remove all the older foliage um, and really take a look, watch what you're doing so you don't cut off any blossoms um, or new foliage stems. But, and then I usually put a little carpet down again of like, finely shredded bark mixed with compost all around so that they don't get splashed by mud in the heavy um, winter rains that we often get. Um, and they will come up beautifully. Again, don't feed them now, but when you do think about it later in the summer, I think about feeding them more like in June, July, August, when they're bud building, way underground, right? Those are the times when you might wanna give your hellebores a little help. Um, and it just a, a neutral, very um, balanced, like a 555 or something of that nature, not heavy duty, big nitrogen. It, that's another thing for the shade garden gal. Using anything over like a 10, 10, 10 in a shade garden can literally melt some native plants. They are not prepared to receive huge amounts of, of uh, high nitrogen or, or high nutrient fertilizers. And it, it, can kill moss, for instance, or even the beautiful various kinds of um, mossy ground covers, silaginellas, and so forth. They're kind of susceptible to um, fertilizer burn. So if you have plants in the shade, and hellebores usually are, remember to use a very um, neutral or light and balanced fertilizer and not a big hunking one that you might put on a big pot of petunias or something like that. Right. This is not the place for uh, <laughs> for that, Sheila. Yeah, on, on hellebores. Um, can can you could I um cut off a a uh, li limb of it, a short one, like about yay big, with flowers already starting and all that, and put it in water? Well, here's the thing: they're hollow tubes, and they tend not to hold very well in indoors. But the English have come up with a trick: they light a candle and then sear the end of the cut so that it's sealed up. And it actually does work. I've done it a few times. It's sort of counterintuitive because I would have thought that you'd want it open to drink as much as possible. But um, yeah, you can try it. They don't usually hold very well indoors though. Take a picture. <laughs> Take a picture. Uh, so it would be just a matter of putting that, that in, in some water, right? Well, like I said, it won't hold very long and just put it in water if the end isn't sealed. Can I put it outside in, in, in soil? Oh, do you want to re you want to make a new plant? Is that what you want to do, Sheila? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, okay, for one thing, a flowered shoot of any kind is not gonna put roots on. 
the plant that that shoot has already invested all its energy into making a flower and now it's going to try to have a seed of some kind right um so if you want to make more of something you would take an unflowered shoot like a hydrangea for instance really easy to propagate you throw them in a tub of water um, but the unflowered shoots the ones that have not produced a flower recently are going to be the ones that will put on the roots the best and the fastest um, and you can add a handful of chopped up willow twigs to make your own willow water, which has natural uh, rooting hormones in it. But if you wanted another hellebore, you have to wait until August. Between August and September is the time when professionals divide their hellebores. And what they do, you dig up the plant and work in the shade and very carefully tease apart or cut apart. You'll see that the root has uh, what looks like a few heads together and buds clustered together and you can tease those apart like daylilies it's much the same and then you want to put them into a medium usually they say like rotted com rotted sawdust but i found good really good luck with um again a mixture of like compost and very finely um, ground arborist wood chips is good because it's open airy just nutritive enough to keep it going you want to give them some shade cloth um, and keep them in the shade and usually in two or three months, you'll get um, a pretty good response. You can also save the seeds and you can tell, okay, so when a hellebore, you know, they dangle down, but when they finally, when they get pollinated and there are lots of pollinators still around in the middle of the winter, they will turn their heads up like that and, and face up. And then, you know, they're pollinated. You can put, and then if you watch, they'll develop seed pods, which look sort of like little inflated bladders. And then down the road, probably June, July, you'll see that they have ripe seed. They're brown, they'll rattle. And um, also a lot of hellebores will sort of go ahead and do that without your intervention. And you'll find a whole lot of little babies clustered around the base of the mom. Um, and those can be taken up and planted in little four inch pots and grown on and planted around wherever you want. Um, can, you got, the, can you plant the seeds? Yeah, you plant the seeds in August and September as well. Okay. And leave them outside so that they go through the winter and experience the freezing and the you know wet dry and that will help because a lot of the seeds have little coats on them that um that have to be dissolved by weather action or digestion of a bird or something like that mm. thank you you're welcome yeah, i um, think about hellebores and, th and thanks for uh, calling for asking that question i hope that ann was able to uh answer you so. Yeah, and again, they're great for shade gardens. And if they do start putting out um, seedlings, take them up, separate them, throw them on, and then put them where you want. Because when they come up really crowded in a mass, like they usually do when they're self-sown, they're not going to succeed as well or be as sturdy. Uh, now, one thing to think about is a lot of the most beautiful hellebores are pretty complex hybrids. They will not, they rarely, like the doubles, very rarely set seed at all. And if they do, it may not look anything like the parent. Um, so, you know, be prepared for it. But on the other hand, that's how a lot of wonderful hellebores were developed, was people pollinated them, grew them on, gathered the seed, grew them out, sometimes growing. I've had friends who grew literally hundreds and hundreds of seedlings and then selected maybe 10, um, because a lot of them are going to look pretty much the same. So, so okay, so I have a, the, my planter, which is about yay, yay deep, okay, mm -hmm. and with soil in it and potting soil in it probably was what I usually use anyway. Um, and I get the seeds from the hellebore and in June or July, no, August, August, yeah, yeah. Uh, August, say. August, I plant the seeds. How far down do I just push them in a little bit? I'll tell you what's really funny. I was at a class of three most amazing gardeners, really famous gardeners, English gardeners, and they were talking about growing hellebores. And one of them, who has a big nursery, said, you have to plant them in a cross, one, two, three, like an equincunx, she said, one, two, three, four, five. And I was like, because? And she just gave me the fisheye look. So <laughs> I, I really personally can't imagine that it matters if, you, if you're off a little on that, but I think maybe the real point was don't crowd them too much. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought it was hilarious that there was extremely specific directions for how to properly plant. How do you? Uh, just, you know, with any seed, basically you want to cover it about the same depth as it is, as it is fat. Does that make sense? Um, as plants grow, most of them are capable of pulling themselves where they want to go. So they'll 
pull themselves, especially a lot of the bulbs and tubers are really good at that. Like plant them too high, they'll pull themselves lower, plant them too low and they'll uh, work their way higher up. Um, a lot of research has shown that most bulbs prefer to be planted less deeply than professional uh, um, advice used to suggest. So instead of putting your daffodils six to 12 inches down, you can put them three inches down and they'll be very happy, thank you, and not have to work so hard to get themselves where they want to go. Um, but with seed, seeds, you're basically just going to, um, and I usually grow seeds in, um, you know, those clamshell lettuce containers. Mm -hmm. Just poke a bunch of holes in the side to get air in there and put and a few holes in the bottom. And then I take um, an extra top or something and put it underneath so it's sitting in a solid thing. And you can use the top as kind of like a mini greenhouse. Just put a little good um, seedling compost in or seedling plant, you know, soil in the bottom. Put your seeds in, just barely cover them. And as they come up, you just want to mist them. You don't pour water in, you mist them right, and use the little top like a greenhouse. When it gets um, bigger, you take the top off and let them grow, and then you can pull those little pieces, at, you know, little guys out and put them into, say, a two-inch pot or a four-inch pot and grow them on. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. The recycling yeah, I, is a great resource. Yeah, I'm just, I was always thinking about, you know, when plants reseed themselves, they don't, they don't bury, the plant doesn't bury the seed that deep. No. No. Well, they don't come out and put little fingers down. Oh. <laughs> but I like the idea that seeds, that seeds kind of will position themselves to their advantage. And, and that just makes me happy. Yeah. I, I don't know why, but it makes me happy. <laughs> don't we all? Yes. <laughs> I see that Terry has a question about sweet peas. And yeah. let's see what she uh, has to say. Oh, I love sweet peas. Sweet, sweet, sweet peas. So I noticed that a bunch of sweet peas have sown themselves in my garden and are already sprouting, um, they will, you know, a lot of times they'll sprout very readily and early. Usually though, March is when you, um, like, you want to plant them out. So you don't want to plant them inside too soon or they start to be pretty leggy and, and lax before you get a chance to put them out, right? But they do like cool weather. They're definitely happy in, in cool weather. But if we are going to get another big snow in February, they probably wouldn't really be thrilled with that so much. So I'd be growing them on, starting them anytime in the next week or two indoors. <clears throat> and I usually do them in four inch pots. Um, put two seeds in each pot and see what you get. And then put them out usually in March. Uh, to, and, and they like, you know, they'll really Sweet peas will grow in practically anything, but they'll really perform better if they have good soil and get fertilized like maybe once a month with again, a nice sort of five, 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 nothing huge. Um, but that way you can get four and five blossoms on every stem and they really smell so sweet. I like to grow them up. I have a very tiny garden now, but I put sweet peas around the hydrangea so they grow up through the hydrangea and climb around in there and, and bloom. Um, and it, it's just lovely to have that amazing fragrance as you're poking around. Oh, I would love to see that. I bet that was just magical looking. Yeah. Yeah, the sweet peas amongst the, the hydrangea leaves. Oh yeah, my gosh. They look good. And, and then um, by the time they're done, the hydrangeas are coming on. So can you pull them out or cut them back? Um, a lot of times, and you can gather your own seeds from sweet peas. If you grow sweet peas and you really like them, um, if you want to have lots and lots of flowers, you want to pick off the, the pods so that you don't, um, you, you don't discourage, because once the plant has made seeds, it figures its job is done and it's over and out. But if you don't let it set seed, it will keep producing flowers. But if you want to save some seeds, then you let it go ahead and ripen off some um, pods and you'll see, collect the biggest pods with the biggest seeds in it. And don't worry about the little bitty ones because they're not worth it. I pick those off and save the bigger ones, but you can collect um, your own seed and grow it on for years and years. And it looks like Terry said, what I start, wait a sec, regular peas at the same time as sweet peas. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the early peas, yeah, definitely, because they are like, again, are warm, um, a cool season crop and they usually I think people do say St. Patrick's Day is good or middle of March um, is a good time to put those in in the garden so they would be a little bigger. If You um, you can also plant them then 
they'll be a little later. I usually plant the summer piece, the little bit more warm season piece, more like the end of March or into April. But the early piece, like the snow peas and the um, pod peas, those you can put in, grow on inside and put outside <laughs> in March. Yeah. And before, when you've had something growing inside and you're gonna take it out, like I have a little greenhouse that's not heated at all. So they can move from that right out to the garden because it's not honestly that different. But if it's been under lights and it's in a warm oh, environment and you're going to put it out, you got to kind of harden them off, which involves putting them out in this on a first into the shade for a few days, just for a few hours and bringing them back in and then putting them into more sun and sort of getting them acclimated to being outside and in sun instead of under grow lights and in warm house. Um, that adjustment, otherwise they can get really shocked. And when plants are shocked like that, they actually not just stop growing, some of them will lose ground essentially. Um, using nutrients to try to repair the damage rather than keep growing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I still love the concept of you were talking about instead of like plants being by themselves is let them kind of intermingle together because they really do have a relationship with each other. Oh, absolutely. And if you look at any natural environment, you know, even in the desert, the distribution of plants is kind of deceptive looking unless you're there at like spring bloom when you suddenly see that every inch of ground is covered. Um, it looks like, and plants generally in those difficult environments space themselves according to the water table for the most part. Um, but the, the quick blooming, fast uh, dying annual flowers are everywhere. I, have it, I don't know if you've probably have seen because you're a California girl, you've mm -hmm. probably seen what that looks like, that incredible. And even in our you know, up in Mount Rainier and our mountain environments, if you look, every inch of ground is full. Like, and you will see a succession of blooms of different colors. If you go up every few weeks or every month, you'll see, you know, a field of white. And then you go back and it's a field of blue. And then you go back and it's a field of yellow um, as the different flowers come and go. But they're all intermingled in any prairie, in any meadow, um, in any woodland that plants share. One of the things that blew my mind was last year in March, there were some um, wonderful reports about ancient native gardens that uh, along the West Coast and on some of the islands and um, in some pretty um, remote environments that native people had known about and went and used and gathered from for like hundreds of years. Scientists had sort of blown it off as myth, but last year some scientists actually went and studied some of the um, the long, these long-term gardens and said, you yeah, know, actually it must be true because there's like 36 kinds of plants in this little patch that wouldn't all be here. They are all native from different up and down the coast. They wouldn't all occur in the same place, but they were self-sustaining and that those gardens were planted deliberately for people, birds, and bears, oh. which I loved because like birds and bears are part of the big picture and, and native people have known that since forever, right? Right. So, yeah, um, native plants can thrive in even, you know, when, as we know, like the shade garden, again, it's like we're planting natives that aren't just necessarily those that have been growing in Bainbridge Island since the pre-Columbian conquest, right? It's like that we can grow all kinds of things and, and tribal people have known that for thousands of years too. But that sustainability piece is, I think, so beautiful. Yes, absolutely. And I love what you told Megan about the tribe using, you know, you have a down cedar and that the, they were, or they'll can come out and, and they just use it. I mean, trees fall all the time because of natural situations, but being able to use them in all the parts for different tools or building or whatever, it's, it's just so good to hear that. Making yeah, nothing, nothing was wasted. Yes. Yeah, it was so fantastic. Hey, does anybody else have a question? We have all kinds of folks here. Well, so uh, we'll be starting our seeds indoors and uh, yeah. So yeah, and that's always so hopeful. The other thing you can always do if you just can't stand it and you need a little spring right now is to, you know, do what I said, like take your lettuce box or some container and put a little potting soil in it, preferably seedling potting soil and sow seeds of um, 
microgreens. You can get packets of those seeds at, at Hume or any of those like right in the grocery store, right? And sow a little bunch of those and you'll find, oh, my granddaughter's here. I know, she's so cute. Oh my gosh, she's adorable. So you'll get these little sprouts in just a few days and you can clip them with um, nail scissors and put them in your salads and stuff or use them as a garnish on soup. But the freshness, it's like we all need some freshness, right? Yes. And that would be spring medicine. One of the things I love about a lot of the tribal traditions, we're going to do a program um, sometime this spring or early summer on Suquamish tribal traditions around food as medicine and recapturing traditions of native foods and how they're passing them down to new generations. Uh, but I love that idea that, you know, we talk about food as medicine, um, but I think bringing it home and sort of saying, yeah, so what does my body want right now? It wants green, fresh things, like a spring tonic, right? Absolutely. So, growing some green sprouts of all those little, because you can do that with like, if you had cabbage seed left over from last year and you're not sure how great it is, so a little of that, because those little cabbage seedlings are really spicy and bright. Um, mm. Now Terry's saying it again, oh. cardoon seeds for the first time. If you're gonna grow cardoons, have plenty of room. They're really large. <laughs> I think people don't always realize how big they can get. Um, but be prepared to give each one like about a four by four ground space and be aware that it might need staking because they can get quite tall, like five, six, even seven feet high. Um, yeah, they're bigger plants than a lot of people think. And a lot of times they're perennial. Um, not necessarily after this big weird winter of ice and snow, but possibly. Um, and so being those, they're considered kind of a perennial crop, something you want to make space for and leave room for. Um, it, it does take a while to grow on the uh, plants to bloom size. Sometimes people prefer to go buy a little six pack or something and have, you know, something that's well on the way. But if you started them now indoors, you'd have pretty good size um, seedlings to put out in, in April, say. And they need good sun, good drainage, medium rich soil, not too rich. A lot of times when you over fertilize plants, they'll go to foliage rather than flowers and fruit. So you don't ever want to dump on the, you know, 2020, 20, like this is not an occasion for Peters. It's more an occasion for 555, five, five. Uh, like Dr. Earth, somebody like that, right? 577, seven, whatever, but low numbers. I'm sorry, I'm ignorant. What is cardoon? <laughs> it's, it's a big, huge leafed perennial that's kind of similar to an artichoke. Oh. Yeah. And that, I mean, that's the short version. Um, they're beautiful. They have really beautiful flowers. Uh, and okay. Yeah. I'll look them up. But, but yeah. yeah, I'm looking at the flower here. It does look very, very close to a, a, an artichoke. They're in the same family and they're similar. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I guess. I love thistles too, but. Yeah. And you know who else loves thistles is goldfinches. Ah. Well, if you grow ornamental thistles, like some of the really cute globe thistles and things, never, never cut those down. You've got to leave those for the goldfinches and you'll have little birds, not just goldfinches, but lots of little birds love those seeds. In fact, that's why I really don't like to cut the garden back heavily in fall because there's so many little birds and insects too will come. And one thing people don't realize is that Hummingbirds don't just live on nectar, they gotta eat protein and protein they get mostly, I mean, some from pollen, but some from insects. And so if you have um, late blossoms and things like that and uh, you, in your garden, you'll have lots of insects and the hummingbirds will be picking those off as well as um, visiting your, uh, your feeders. Ah. I have two very territorial hummingbirds um, that I have feeders, two feeders on the porch. And every day I go out and say, you guys share, don't be so mean. They spend a lot of time and energy uh, defending their turf and fighting off these others. There's three or four others that like to come and sneak in. And sometimes they bother them at the front and then somebody will zip, zip around the back and get to the other feeder. You can see their deep strategies. And if it ever isn't full enough, when I walk out the door, they start circling my head and buzzing yeah. me. Like, excuse me, you are slacking off. Yeah. When it was cold, I was bringing one in taking one out and rechanging them and you do have to remember even in the winter when it's cold you got to wash them out really good every week and make sure they're really always clean but you don't get mold and mildew so much when it's 17 degrees outside right yeah syrupy stuff takes a while to freeze so usually you can put it out you know for four or five hours 
and then so I would rotate them in and out and in and out and yeah. they really appreciate that because you know until the late 60s um hummingbirds didn't overwinter here but when as more and more people began feeding them the annas especially have taken to overwintering and so they really depend on us and if you start feeding and then get bored or just forget to do it you're kind of stranding these poor little puppies yeah. so we gotta if you're gonna do it you gotta do it right keep it up yeah yeah think what they was reading is that you only want to use cane sugar not beet sugar or honey or anything else like that but cane sugar um and just one cup per four cups of water uh, that audubon recipe and not try to give them more because you think in winter they need it extra they're an uh, you know, nectar doesn't get that strong in nature and they can't really use it. So making sure that you're not giving them more than they can effectively use is a good technique. Yeah, good to know. Any more questions or comments? Wow. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, and it's all, oh, look at Rita, do you have a question? Oh. I don't have a question. I just wanted to say thanks again for you know, keeping us on the right track and <laughs> trying to keep us from being too tidy and, and use what's available in nature. <laughs> well, before we go, I wanted to show you something fun. In this neighborhood, when you're not feeling good, you'll wake up and find soup on your doorstep. And this oh. morning it was um, chickpea stew with kale and coconut milk, which is really nice. But there was also a package of plant colored crayons to draw with. Oh. which I thought was really, really sweet, right? Yes. And because we've been working on um, Valentine's, so we're doing, we got um, the little craft shop. Here has cardstock that you can buy, like an empty card and an envelope, a box of them. And so we're making, we're starting on our Valentine's a little early this year as a mm. taste of spring. Yes. Hey, Anne, really can, I, can I ask you a really quick question? Sure. Um, for Christmas, my sister gave us about 50 uh, tulip bulbs. Do you think those are good pollinators and where would it be better to have them closer to the garden for pollinating or somewhere else? Well, tulips need sun and they like to dry out. So, you know, and usually typically you would have planted them. Did you plant them already or no? No. Okay. If as long as they haven't frozen, they're probably fine and you could plant them in big pots, which is what I often do. And move them around but um deer will eat them mm -hmm. that's one thing if because you're kind of near the woods i don't know if you have a fenced area or not but we otherwise do. you kind of want to keep them near the house so the deer don't nip all the buds off just as they're getting good but there are quite a lot of pollinators that do uh visit tulips as you would notice one thing that's really fun to do with my grandkids and i sometimes do is like sit out in the garden and watch who comes to what and and see the great variety of pollinators that are out there you know, it's not just bees, and there are many, many native bees, too. We have hundreds of, of species of native bees, but it's really fun to see what's buzzing in the garden and who's, uh, who's using what, because many bees are uh, generalists that will take whatever they can get, wherever they can find it. Um, so they don't, only, some are very specific, like there are blueberry bees and squash bees, but most of them are happy to do, take native plants when they're there and go sip off a, you know, nasturtium when they're not. Mm -hmm. Hey, Anne, can we see more of your top, your shirt, your coat you're wearing? I love the top of that. It is so adorable, it's isn't that? Yeah, it's my spring top. Um, oh. I just decided <laughs> it's made by a women's collective in Tibet, and you get it from the Greater Good. The Greater Good Foundation um, sells a lot of stuff that supports many, many different things, like you can support pet shelters and women's shelters and you know, these women's collectives in Tibet and vets and all kinds of things. Um, but yeah, it's, so it's feel good. You know, you know, oh, yeah. it's handmade. You can probably tell. It's, it's really beautiful. Cool. Yeah. And they're not even expensive. So it's like guilt-free clothing, right? Right. I'll have to check them out. And it's cotton so that it's compostable when it reaches the end of its life. Hooray! <laughs> yes. Well, so. Spring is coming, everybody. Hang in Yay. there. Yay. Well, thank you so much, Anne. And everybody get out there and get some sunshine and uh, enjoy this beautiful day. Thanks. Thanks again, Anne.